Hey, this is Kenneth, and today let's do a, a repeater design example using a RIC repeater interface communications kit to build a bi-directional crossband repeater. Uh, the parts we're going to be using for this is an MFJ916B diplexer, two Motorola Radius Max tracks, one of them a UHF, one of them a VHF, and then a RIC as our controller. All right, so let's just start walking through the parts here one at a time. As far as the diplexer, like I said, we're, I'm using this cheap MFJ, the $25 diplexer. It's not nice. It unfortunately comes with PL259 connectors on it, um, which I use for practically nothing. And so I've just parked three BNC connectors on it since this is typically my prototype um, diplexer that I just use in the lab here and with my base station that I also I have my lab, right? And so this, that'll go to the antenna, um, which I use BNC on. Then the transmitter and the receiver, I'll have little BNC jumpers going from this to the max tracks. All right, so let's look at the next, the max tracks. Um, I like using Motorola max track radios like this, um, primarily because they are um, readily available. Uh, I have a lot of friends that work in county communications, so they, they maintain the radio systems for county fire departments, police departments, sheriff departments, and so they actually give me these by the box load. So I, I generally have a pretty good supply of these max track radios. Um, they're 25 watts, and the reason why they're so avail readily available is because they only do wideband. So you can't do any part 90 or part 95 on these radios. They're only useful for me for prototyping um, repeater systems in the amateur band, um, part 97, which still allows wide modulation. So look at the front here, you've got your uh, on-off switch plus volume. You've got your microphone jack here, um, channel select or mode select, um, monitor for turning off the squelch, scan, um, selecting uh, stuff for the scan button, on the top, this is kind of the a thermal thermal label I've started using just to identify my equipment. Um, it's it's a bad idea for me to be using a thermal label here, and I know that because when these radios get hot, the label then just turns black. Um, but I I'm lazy, and this generally works well enough for me for now. Um, and it's usually pretty clear on what equipment's mine. So this is kind of more of a when stuff is getting shuffled around pre and post event. Um, and yeah, you now know my standard standard frequencies um, from this example, so that's awkward. On the back, we've got a connector parked here. Um, this is the RF connector for the Max Track. It uses this really awkward mini UHF connector, which I use for absolutely nothing except for screwing permanently screwing BNC connectors, adapters onto my Max Track so that then I can just use BNC. Um, this is the Motorola Bullet Power Connector. Uh, I think they're popular in um, RVs and trailer homes and stuff, but it's, I really don't like it as a connector because it's hermaphroditic, but lets you plug power in wrong. Um, so again, I use it for practically nothing except Motorola's and I build these six inch Motorola power to power pole so that I can then pull, plug it into my standard power buses, which are all power pole. Oh, sorry. And probably the most valuable part of the um, higher end max track radios and the, like the GM 300 and the radio series is this 16 pin connector. Um, some, of the, some of the early and lower end models of max tracks have five pin connectors here, um, and those aren't as useful to me, but the 16 pin ones are fantastic. Um, and most, practically all of Motorola has standardized on this, on all of their you know, CDM 1250s and 1225 uh, series, and so all of their newer radios, it's just plug and play. But what's really neat and useful about this 16 pin connector is that it provides all the signals as well as some pro programmable input output pins on it, um, which makes it really easy to use this to interface with the repeater controller. All right, 
And so if we look at the repeater controller, this is a repeater interface communications kit, or also called a Motorola RIC. Um, on the front, it's really simple. It has one power switch, which it calls the power repeater enable. So you know, it's off, and then you can turn it on, and the green light will light up. Um, it also has what's called setup, as you can remotely enable it and disable it um, while it's turned on, um, which toggles this light. I've never used that feature, so I there's a jumper inside of it which makes it so that it comes up enabled or, you know, or set up, and then you can just push button this button to also set it up if you're locally there. And then the red light is its COR signal or um, carrier operated relay, um, which indicates that its re its receiver is currently receiving a signal, and the repeater is trying to or you know, should be re trying to repeat it, right? And so on the front, it's pretty much just a power switch, a power light, and a single you know, activity light to show that something's going through the repeater. On the back, we can see we've got, these are the two ports I typically use. These are the, the exact same 16 pin Motorola accessory connectors as on the MaxTrack. Um, one of them for the receiver and one of them for the transmitter. And so, in its most basic configuration, what you literally just do is have two straight through cables that take pin one from here and plug it into pin one on the transmitter, pin two from here, pin two to the transmitter, right? So it's just a 16, you know, straight, it's a, 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 exactly the pin out that's on the back of the radio. You have a third accessory, 16 pin accessory, which is um, for your, uh, like a, an external controller, right? Which is a bit awkward to think that you'd have a controller plugged into this controller, but this is a very, very basic controller, so if you wanted an accessory to plug into this controller, you'd plug in there. And then it has two um, six-position RJ connectors here, which are designed for some of the, which are designed for the max track and radius, you know, for the radius radios that don't have the 16-pin. Um, you can use just this. It's not ideal. I've never actually used these. I always just insist on getting 16 pin um, radius radios and then use this, All right? And so this um, actually, uh, one of these pins on the back here is also power. So you'll notice there's no power connector because you actually feed power in from the radio here. And so the RIC has two six, 16 pin cables running to two max tracks. Um, the max tracks then have their 12 volts coming in via the bullet connectors. I've got mini UHF to BNC connectors here with short BNC cables to the diplexer, which then goes out to the antenna. Um, as far as the exact pinouts, this is where having a notebook comes in real handy. This is, this is my radio projects notebook, um, which has in it just I did, uh, notes from individual deployments as well as these kind of you know quick dirty reference data sheet pages so I'll, I'll have a page kind of dedicated to each set of pinouts so you notice this is a the Motorola pinouts which has on it the front microphone jack with its pinout and the 16 pin accessory connector with its pinout um, you can use the front microphone jack the front microphone jack has the microphone audio which is you know what you would speak into and the receive audio which is all you absolutely need but it it lacks the cor signal from the receiver and so i tend not to use it um unfortunate thing uh convention that motorola used is you'll notice here I, I made it very clear what the numbering is because motorola actually uses the opposite numbering from ethernet Right, so I'm used to working with our, uh, 8P8C RJ connectors where the pins are numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But you'll notice that they go from 8 to 1 here. So calling out pin numbers on the microphone, microphone uh, on the Motorola microphone connectors is painful and unpleasant. And so I actually have somewhat standardized personally on I will actually call out Motorola microphone pins using the 568B color code, 
um, since I'm usually building interface cables that go into the microphone jack using um, category 5e cable I just literally call out if you were to crimp this connector as if it was an Ethernet cable using 568B these are the colors right because trying to say you know it's pin 4 but what would really be pin 5 and you mean pin 5 like the actual pin 5 or the Motorola pin 5 or which one is the actual pin 5 um, I found that just trying to use the 1 through 8 is a losing proposition which is why when I have any interfaces colors right um, going down the list here uh, pin 1 or and I guess this is Motorola pin 1 uh, is an 8 volt power source from the radio um, if you want to power whatever you have plugged into it, right? So some microphones will have preamplifiers in them. If you were interfacing the RIC through this front plate, this is what you would use to power it from the receiver. Um, pin 2 is unconnected. Pin 3 is what's called the uh, on-hook signal, um, which I'll talk about later. 4 is ground. 5 is the microphone audio, so that's the microphone that you speak into and is what then gets transmitted after it goes into this connector. Six is the push to talk signal, so you ground this signal to key up the radio. Seven is the SCI plus pin, which is used for programming the radio. This is a one wire bus that you um, use to download and upload the code plug from the radio using a Motorola RIB, which stands for Radio Interface Box. Um, so I have, a, I have a dedicated computer that has a RIB and it boots into DOS to run the um, RSS software to talk to these radios. And then pin 8 is receive audio. Um, so this is whatever is coming into the radio over RF that you can then hear. So if you were to plug a headset into uh, this front panel um, microphone jack, uh, this is what would go into your earphones. Um, I don't like using this signal for repeaters because it's dependent upon where you set the volumes, the volume knob, right? And so if we were to set the volume knob there, um, the repeater may be repeating um, the audio correctly, but then if you were to bump it and move it up to there, suddenly whatever audio comes in on this radio, the repeater would repeat it at a much higher volume and it would sound bad. Um, and it would have an incorrect what's called repeater gain is ideally whatever re audio is received in the repeater comes out at the same volume exactly the same um, and so you would have to like set this knob exactly where it needs to be and then like mark it or super glue it or tape it there um, which I don't like to do and so I generally just um, don't use it uh, the on hook signal here um, is actually kind of nice because what it does is it disable when, when the microphone goes off hook it disable it ha there's an option which I leave on to disable carrier squelch or tone squelch sorry um, it disables the tone squelch so that it's like um, so that you know if you have multiple different users on one channel using different tones um, they could not hear each other and wouldn't have to listen to each other, but then as soon as you pick up the microphone to say something, you would suddenly hear, oh, there is someone else on the channel, I shouldn't try and talk over them. Um, I like to leave that option enabled because it, it makes it a little bit easier to diagnose a repeater if you can turn on and off tone squelch relatively easily, um, but I don't want it, you know, I, I want to be able to, you know, quote, hang up the microphone every once in a while, even though there's no microphone plugged into this radio um, traditionally. And so I have built, and you'll see a lot of people doing this, uh, what are essentially, you know, on-hook on dongles. So I've, I've taken a 8P8C connector and I've shorted Motorola pins 3 and 4, which is actually pins 5 and 6, um, and crimped it just like this. And then this dongle gets plugged into the front of the radio and the radio thinks that it's then on hook and it you know shuts up um, the radio except for when it has anything come in with tone squelch. Um, convenient 
if you're not at all concerned about, you know, if, there, if there's no one within earshot of the repeater, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't change the behavior of the back connector at all. Um, but, you know, that's, that's just something I do. As far as the 16 pin connector, this is the one that I really like because it has a, um, this pin 11, which is a receive audio, which is independent of the volume knob on the front. And so it's always 600 millivolts peak to peak. I believe it's peak to peak. Um, I can never remember, but it's a 600 millivolts signal that comes out on pin 11 all of the time. That's it. Um, as far as all the other pins, um, pins 1 and 16 are for if you want to have an external speaker wired into this instead of using uh, the, there's a speaker right here in the faceplate, but if you want a larger or nicer speaker or a speaker somewhere else, um, you wire it up to these pins 1 and 16. Um, but if you don't, what you do need to do is you need to wire one of those two pins from the external speaker to the internal speaker. The internal speaker actually is only wired to this back connector, not internally. And so um, if you're not using this radio as a repeater, you'll see these uh, kind of, again, sort of a dongle wire uh, just plugged into the back that you'll notice here has pins 15 and 16 shorted together so that the front panel mic uh, speaker works. Pin two um, is the equivalent of the microphone pin on the front. So it's a, a five or 600 ohm connector that's expecting 50 mil, a millivolt, a 50, a, sorry, a 50 millivolt signal. Three is your push to talk. Four is a output pin. Five is a flat audio in. So it's, this is right after, so the microphone pin here goes into a microphone preamp which then goes to this pin. And so if you don't need to use the microphone preamp, you can feed in a slightly higher signal at a higher impedance um, on pin five. Six is an input, seven is the ground pin on the connector, eight is a programmable input output, nine is a programmable input, 10 is a programmable input, 11 is this uh, flat receive audio from the demodul, uh, from the detector, and so it's not at all going through the audio amplifier chain, so um, it's steady state, it's the same level all the time. 12 is a programmable input output. 13 is your accessory power connector, so this is just a you know 12 volt at half an amp source to whatever you have plugged in here. 14 is programmable input output, and then 15 and 16 are you know for the internal and external speaker. Um, You'll also notice I, in here in the notebook, I happen to have digit key part numbers for the connector housing and then the, the contacts that go inside of this for when I'm building my own connectors, you know, my own cables for this. Um, as far as what an actual interface cable would look like, it looks like this, um, which, you know, then makes sense why it has this big tab with the three holes on it. It's so you can zip tie the cable to it for strain relief. So. This is, uh, I, I never actually bother populating all 16 pins like they did here, uh, but this was this cable was given to me by one of my friends. Um, so you know, that's, that's what it looks like. You plug this in, um, and then this little tab here is the uh, retention release. So when you plug it, when you plug it in to pull, here, let's actually. So there's the back of the radio. Here's the connector and it goes in like that. And then to get it back out, what you do is you push on that tab there um, to release it. Then you can pull it back out. All right. So that is the two Motorola connectors, right? And so we're gonna be parking a on hook dongle in here. And then on the 16 pin, we're gonna be using this straight through cable, which is just pins one through 16 to pins one through 16 um, on one to the other. And that pretty much covers the actual interfacing with the radius. So now let's look at the RIC.
Um, the Rick has the same 16 pin accessory connectors on it, uh, except we're, we're only interested in mic audio, push to talk, the flat audio, ground, pin eight as one of the options for the carrier operated relay, which is you know the signal that says, I am receiving something. 11 is the receive audio. 13 is gonna be power fed to the RIC from the receive radio. And 14 is the second COR option. You'll notice I have a note here. Um, there's, there's dip switches inside that let you pick between eight and 14 to use them as your COR, but that's only for the receive to transmit ports. If you're trying to build a bi-directional repeater, you have to be able to receive on the transit port and transmit on the receive port. Although you still call them the receive and transmit radios just for clarity's sake. Um, but in the transmit to receive direction, it only supports pin eight as COR. So you must use pin eight as COR from transmit to receive. And you, that means that you know, on a bi-directional repeater, you have to use 14 as your COR from your receiver to your transmitter. Um, and so you'll notice uh, my convention, personal convention is to have VHF be the receiver and UHF the transmitter. And so since the UHF radio is a transmitter, you can see I have this note here that says pin eight is the PL CSQ COR pin. So I have in the RSS software programmed it to say on pin eight, when you have both carrier, the receiver is sensing a carrier and it's decoding the correct PL or CTCSS tone, um, actuate this pin low to indicate that you're receiving something. And then on my VHF radius max track, I have pin 14 configured in the same way, right? Um, this is knowing exactly which pins these are, are important when uh, I'm building my own cables because I only populate these specific pins. In this case, since we're using these 16, you know, these really nice 16 pin cables that populate all 16, it doesn't really matter. Um, this is a little cheat sheet as far as building, as configuring the bi-directional mode in the RIC um, based on there is a 12 position dip switch inside of it and a little jumper that you need to set up in this configuration to be a bi-directional repeater. Um, the manual for the RIC has a two page worksheet where it asks you a bunch of questions and you fill it out and then it tells you how to set up the dip switches exactly. But this on, on, off, 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 on, off, on, off, on, on, off is what I always use for my bi-directional repeaters. And this is a little, a little list of notes for what each of those dip switches does. Um, I don't think we're gonna go over that. I think we're just gonna, you know, here it is. You can pause the video if you really wanna try and decode my terrible handwriting. Um, so let's actually look at the RIC, right? Uh, so only two uh, T15 torque screws. So let's try and find the right torque here. <laughs> so the front front face plate comes off. Circuit board then slides out. And here is the Rick. It's kind of a it's it's a very very simple device. It literally has 15 transistors and 2D flip-flops on it. Um which makes it a little bit frustrating that these things still sell for like $100 on eBay, but there you go. Um, and you'll notice here is the 12 position dip switch, right? And so since we want it as a bi-directional repeater, we want to make sure that one and two are on, three, four, and five are off, six is on, seven is off, eight is on, nine is off, 10 and 11 are on, and 12 is off. Um, here is your power switch, which actually turns on and off uh, four different things inside of the repeater. Here is uh, J6, which is a jumper for the uh, setup and knockdown mode. By putting it in the left position, um, it just it starts the RIC in 
setup mode, which is all I ever use, um, you know, where this also causes it to be set up. And then what's important to note here is that there are these two potentiometers, um, R23 and R24. These two potentiometers are what you use to set the repeater gain. Um, and so to set the, I thought I wrote this down somewhere. I believe R23 is the receive to transmit audio gain and 24 is the transmit to receive audio gain. And so what, what I'm going to do once we wire this all up is s transmit a three kilohertz deviation tone into the receiver and then set this potentiometer so that on the transmit side, I'm also seeing the same three kilohertz deviation. Um, otherwise, th the repeater would always sound relatively quiet or well, relatively loud, but I want to set it so that the same deviation going in is what comes out. And then I'll just reverse the frequencies. Transmit on the transmit frequency and look at the receive radio to, and set this tone to set the same uh, three kilohertz deviation at one kilohertz audio tone um, to be three kilohertz de deviation out. All right, so I know this video is getting long, but I'm gonna wire, wire this all up and show it to you. And then we'll fire up the service monitor and set the uh, repeater gain. All right, so I've got it all wired up and fired up the service monitor, as you can probably hear. So, again, we've got the, the bare Rick PCB here so that we can get to the two tuning potentiometers for the repeater gain. 16-pin um, audio cables running from these to the back of the two radiuses. Um, these are both powered off of a battery I've got sitting behind my bench. And then these two both have BNC jumpers running to this diplexer. And this would go to your antenna, but which in my case is running to the service monitor itself. So now what we're going to do is we're going to feed a reference signal into the receiver and set calibrate this potentiometer so that the transmitter feeds the same reference signal out. And then we'll just reverse it and do it in the opposite direction. Um, all I'm going to be doing out of screen here is turning these two potentiometers with a screwdriver. So I think we'll just focus on the actual display of the service monitor itself. So panning up. What you're looking at here is a HP 8935 service monitor. Uh, I've, I'm, I'm gonna be using the RF generator screen, which you can see is this lower half here, and the RF analyzer screen, which has its readouts here and configured down here. So we're first going to configure the RF analyzer for what is our transmit frequency. So dialing down here, our, we want to tune to 446.050 megahertz. The input port we're going to want it on the RF in. And so everything up here, the, the transit power, the frequency error, the FM deviation, and the audio frequency are going to be read out at that frequency. So now what we want to do is we want to key up this crossbander on the other frequency. So the frequencies is going to be 146. Oh, no, 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 come on. 146.535 megahertz. And we're going to want to generate an audio frequency of 1 kilohertz, route it to the FM modulator with a deviation of 3 kilohertz. We then also, to get the repeater to key up, need to generate the PL tone. So the PL tone is 127.3 hertz, routed to the FM modulator with a deviation of 600 hertz. Right. So this is just, on your radio, this would be generated by you setting your PL correctly, which you now know by group's PL. And this one kilohertz signal is simulating what would be you actually speaking into the repeater and saying something useful. We'll then come over here to the amplitude, turn on the generator, and set it to negative 80 dBm. All right, so we have a nice strong signal coming in, and we can see the transmit power that we're, is coming out of the UHF side is 18.6 watts. The frequency error is 
600, uh, about 700 hertz low, which is way too high, so I actually need to clearly need to realign this UHF radio. The FM deviation, the, well, the audio frequency is 1 kilohertz, which is what we expected, but this FM deviation here is what we need to fix, right? And so this is the trimming potentiometer inside the rick so that the we want this to match the 3 kilohertz deviation down here, and so I'm going to take a screwdriver and take turn potentiometer R23 up and the tone will get actually get louder until we up. Oh. Uh, so that tone was actually the uh, UHF radius max, max track timing out because we had had it transmitting too long. So I'll turn it off, let it cool down a little bit and then key it up again and then continue playing with this potentiometer until we're right at 3 kilohertz, right? So whatever comes in on the VHF side will now sound just as loud and not any louder on the UHF side, right? So now all we need to do is reverse it. So let's go to the analyzer screen. We want to analyze on 146.535 megahertz. And we want to generate on 446.0 uh, 050, 146.050 megahertz. Turn on the amplitude. And so now this is going in the reverse direction. So this is coming in on UHF and coming back out on VHF. So you'll notice the VHF radio is perfect. It uh, doesn't have the frequency error. So the VHF radio is fine. Uh, slightly higher power on the VHF side. So we got 23 watts there. Um, and again, the deviation is a little low, so I'm going to turn up R24. Let's see if I can turn down some of these speakers. Turn up R24 until we're right at 3 kilohertz. Alright, so at this point, it's the repeater's, the rick is aligned. Um, and we're good to go there. The, I'm going to need to take the UHF radio and put it and hook it up to R the RSS software and do a frequency alignment on it, clearly, um, if I were to actually use the system. But at this point, if we wanted, you know, if I was actually going to use the system, I could package this all up and deploy it. All right, I'd put this back in the case. I, I have a, a U bracket that this would mount on and put it on there. Um, the issue is, it's really not possible to build, I mean, this is this repeater controller, the RIC is as simple as it gets, as far as, it, it's just a in, audio interface box. It doesn't meet any of the ID requirements for Part 97, or for many of the deployment, other deployments I use. Um, so it's not a particularly useful controller, right? I used it here just as a simple example, um, to show you the, the concept of the repeater gain, but you c even for cross-band repeaters for Part 97, it needs to have some sort of local, you know, knockdown and ID. Um, the RIC supports knockdown, but it doesn't have that ID capability, so you either need to plug something into the accessory jack um, or just use a better controller. I've got a lot of other controllers, which in later videos I might concentrate on that, but here I just wanted to show you the concept of taking these four blocks in the block diagram and how you would conceivably plug them together. So, not an actual field legal repeater, but that's kind of how you would get started on building one. Again, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Um, if you have any interest in specific facets of this that you would like another video, or if you have any interest in other repeater related topics that you want the next video to be on. Um, I will gladly take those suggestions. Uh, other than that, thanks for watching, and I hope you come back next time. Thanks.